Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I'm basically here to convince you all that my particular isn't working. There we go. That my sincere belief that rolling releases are the future of Linux distributions. You know, I, I the more I look at this, the more I've been working in this. So my, my history is I've been a, an OpenSUSE contributor now for 11 years since the project started. Um, in the last three years, I've actually started working for SUSE testing the enterprise distribution, so the regular stuff. So, you know, I've, I've been a regular distribution guy for a, for a really long time. But because of Tumbleweed, what we've been doing in Tumbleweed for years now, I, I, I see this as the trend of, for all distributions, where things are going. And of course, that comes with certain issues and certain problems, and you know, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, really need to start in the beginning with all of this stuff of, you know, how how this began and and you know what the heck is a Linux distribution anyway? So you know we're in the distro dev room. Most of us know what a regular release is. You know most Linux distributions are a regular release, releasing every X months or X years. You know on some kind of regular cadence. Generally speaking, once it's released, you're freezing the versions, or if you are upgrading, you're somewhat reluctantly upgrading those versions. You know, we're trying to keep a, a nice, stable distribution for our users. We don't want to constantly be breaking everything all of the time. And then if we do have to fix something, we're generally talking about backporting individual fixes and, and narrowly fixing the distribution, not wholesale changing package versions. Um, you know, so generally speaking, this is you know, the, the Fedora, the, the Debian, the traditional OpenSUSE model, and of course, the Ubuntu model. One of the problems with regular releases, okay, how do you then actually do a big step change? How do you develop that? How do you, you know, get ready for the next version? So all these distributions pretty much have some kind of, of dev branch. You know, Tumbleweed, so OpenSUSE, we used to call that factory. In Fedora, in Fedora they call it Rawhide, Debian, SID. <coughs> you know, a development branch where developers can just check in their stuff, build, you know, packages get built, maybe daily ISOs or something gets spun out. And you have the you know the next base for the next major release of your, your distribution. Um, you know, so it's always released and you know nothing's frozen, nothing backported, just pure code going in making packages. And without fail, it's normally broken. You know, it, it you know it, you're lucky if it gets working in the last couple of weeks before you release. But even then, it's normally broken. But that's what us distro guys have to live with. You know, we're dealing with this lovely broken dev branches all the damn time. Um, but that that's kind of a big problem for not just distro developers, but any general developer looking to target your platform. I mean, you know, they need to be close to, you know, your latest and greatest, your latest upstream, and all of the latest versions of all those upstream packages you have in your dev branch, but it's completely unstable and unusable. And, you know, we've got work to do, but it's always breaking. <laughs> so you end up with people coming up with wonderful hacky clutches of, you know, maybe taking the stable base and running some PPA or OBS repo on top of it. But, you know, then they have to rebase all of that. It's always a mess. So, you know, it's a nightmare to develop on. It's a nightmare to develop for. For distributions in particular, this becomes a big community and societal problem. I mean, if your, de if your dev branch is not stable, how are you going to get new contributors to your next release? Well, you're not. They're going to go away and play with something else. You know, you get less bugs being filed. You get less polish on your distribution. You know, and then, you know, even with your, your regular release cadence, you have a hard time actually getting that release out the door. And I think most distributions that have been around for the last few years have had these terrible problems. OpenSUSE definitely has of chugging along with a plan, trying to get a, a six or an eight months release, you know, release out, and then you're, you know, in the last month or so and you realize our dev branch is totally messed up. We're gonna have to delay for two months, three months, four months, and you know, and you know, we've we've done that. Fedora has problems like that as well, Ubuntu have. It always happens, and a big part of this is the, the, the technical debt that comes with that. You know, because you haven't got people using that all the time, all these kludgy little hacks get in there, you're going to have to fix it sooner or later, but your dev branch is a complete mess. <coughs> and from a project point of view, that generally ends up being a bit of a decline for that distribution. You know, less people are using you, you're not moving that fast, you're not that interesting for anybody, your project starts stagnating, everything starts going downhill. It's also a problem for upstreams, you know, they want their software in the hands of users. You know, that's the point. And having a regular release with all that freezing is way too slow for them. They're 
you know, they're not going to be able to deliver their software till eight months or a year later or two years later. Dev branches don't do that at all, and regular releases don't do it at all. It's a complete mess. There's no way of targeting for upstream developers. Everybody likes to talk about Flatback and Snappy and containerized apps um, and you know, promise that it's absolutely wonderful and going to solve everything. It solves some of the problems, um, and I'll be talking about that more in Janssen at 1 o'clock today. And then last, but by no means least, of course, you know, users. They're, they're our enthusiasts. They're here. They're the ones who want to run everything, see what we're doing. One minute. There we go. They don't want to wait. They want to get their latest software as soon as that upstream's published it. You know, new version of GNOME or KDE, they want to be running it right away. But they also want a consistent experience. They don't just want some hacked together little bundle running on top of whatever distro they've chosen. They want that polished. They want it integrated with the entire experience. They want it easy to install and maintain. They want it well patched. And you, when you start talking to a lot of, especially long-term Linux users, the, the, you know, ask them why they pick their distribution, that kind of, you know, some, somewhat intangible quality of, oh, it just felt right. It was put together properly, so that's why I'm still using it, is the reason why we end up keeping those users and why we drive more people into, into, into our distributions is because we've got those things right. That you know, user experience, but more than that, of just building it properly, building it consistently, and convincing people that, you know, we're doing this the right way for the right reasons with the right things. And they're the ones who are going to be the, the contributors of tomorrow. But they can't use our dev branches, and our regular releases are too slow. So in come rolling releases. Now, everybody hopefully knows what a rolling release is, but generally speaking, a rolling release has no release schedule. Most, if not all, packages are frequently updated. Some distributions like to be partially rolling, so you know, have a frozen bit, but I'll be talking about more on that later. And updates are delivered when they're ready. And of course, when they're ready is a nice quirky definition, so, you know, when is something ever ready? And the main examples that I can think of for this are, you know, obviously Arch Linux, you know, and Gentoo who kind of popularized the whole thing, and I'm here to talk about Tumbleweed. Quite often, the feedback I hear about rolling releases, though, is it's unstable. You know, it changes too much. I can't trust it. Even if I do try it, it's unreliable. It breaks too often. Or it's just hard to live with. There's too much extra work I have to do to keep up with this rolling thing. And when it comes to the sort of the, the stability side of things, and in this case I'm really talking about stability in how fast is something moving. The, you know, I, I'm talking much about yeah, yeah, something always changing. You know, that's the point of a rolling release. You know, you want to get that new software in the hands of users. You need to be moving at that pace. These upstreams are moving faster and faster. We need to be keeping up with them, or in some cases maybe even going faster than they are. That's the point. But then you've got to deliver it to your users and your developers who need to use the damn thing. So it has to be built and tested and then integrated together in a consistent way. And this is a problem that I don't think many rolling distributions really get a, a complete handle on. You know, there's a habit in distribution sites to think of, oh, we're just putting together a bunch of packages and then it's a collection. You know, no, we're shipping an operating system that contains a bunch of packages, but we have to get all of that integration right. And that's more true with a rolling release than anything else. Um, and also, that also means finding a way to shield those users not from breakage, I'll talk about that next, but from those behavioral changes. You know, upstream has made some crazy decision to change something in their application. What if the user who's got his project to do tomorrow doesn't know how to do that yet? You know, doesn't know how to use that new feature or, you know, deal with those new defaults. So there has to be some way of shielding those users from the unexpected behavioral changes just so they can get on with the work they've got to get on and then and learn the new feature when they have the time to sit down and learn it. On the reliability side of things, rolling releases have the tr you know, typically get accused of always breaking. You know, it's got thousands of moving parts from thousands of different upstream projects. Getting all that working together, especially when you know those upstream projects have dependencies on you know somewhere in between and they're all moving at different paces, is a constant challenge. Just like I said, when when it comes to the stability side of things, you know, we have to build this 
together. We have to test it together, and we have to integrate it as one consistent distribution. This is not a piece of parts. It has to, rolling release has to be everything done as a consistent distro. In practical terms, that means testing at the submission. So each submission being tested to make sure that isn't going to break everything. And then also not forgetting about testing as a whole. It doesn't matter if that one package is fine, if when you put that in, it breaks 20 other things. So testing the entire distribution, including all of those changes in one go. And obviously, users shouldn't be shipped something that doesn't work. You know, This isn't a dev branch we're talking about here. And really, dev branches that break aren't that useful anyway. The thing has to at least work in some basic functional sense. And then I looked at how other distributions deal with testing. Most of us deal with testing. We used to deal with it this way. Uh, the concept of sort of passive testing. You know, we put it in some testing branch, Debian testing, you know, whatever. And just leave it there for a couple of weeks and trust that the community will go away and test it. And then if they haven't found any bugs, that's good enough, we ship it. It's madness, but we all do it. But it's absolute madness. And it works better or worse depending on how big your community is, but it's still playing Russian roulette. You know, okay, you've got a huge pile of testers, okay, you've got more chambers in the gun, you're slightly less likely to get your head shot off, but if you've got lots of developers, you've got more bullets in the gun. Eventually someone's going to get shot. So for a rolling release, you need to actively confirm this thing will work. Does it work in isolation? Does it work in a broader context? And does the behavior change in a user, you know, the way a user expects? You, know, you, want, you need to shield the users from that. You need to at least be able to warn them, OK, this package is going to completely change how these commands work. This UI element is going to change. You, know, you need to be aware that this stuff is you know, going to start hitting your users before it hits them. But you need to have all those answers, ideally, before upstream have even finished their release. <laughs> or at least as fast as you can afterwards, because you need to be shipping this stuff as fast as you can after the upstream projects have finished what they're doing. And this is really the ultimate challenge of the whole thing. And well, yeah, the solutions are hopefully quite interesting. And then talking about things hard to live with, you know, when you look at rolling releases, you know, Arch have a, a great philosophy that I really agree with. You know, do it yourself. It's a learning exercise. For the Arch, for Arch, it works really, really well. The Gen 2 way, they don't have a nice definition, but that's kind of my variant of it. <laughs> um, you know, do it yourself, and then you've got time to read the Arch wiki to figure out what's going on while the whole thing's compiling. And with both of these distributions and a lot of others, you know, if something goes wrong, that's it. You're on your own. Good luck. Get, get out Vim or Emacs. Yeah, you might get lucky to fix it. But who said rolling releases had to be difficult? You know, those fit for their users fine, but the problems are much broader than that. And I, I think the solution is actually much, much broader than that. And this is, this is where Tumbleweed came in. Now, I'd love to be to take credit and say it was all my idea, but it wasn't. Um, Tumbleweed in initially started in the OpenSUSE community by Greg Crow Hartman. He was working at SUSE at the time. And what SUSE was doing with our, and OpenSUSE was doing with our traditional releases was way too boring for him. You know, upstream kernel hackers, you know, he needs something completely different. And it originally started as a, a effectively an add-on to the original OpenSUSE distribution. So we started with the base system and did rolling stuff on top. Now, over the last couple of years, it's totally transformed from that model to what I'm going to talk about in a minute where it's now moving at the pace of contribution. The entire code base will move as fast as our contributors can get those stuff packaged. And we have a process and the tools and the technology to move that incredibly quickly with, the, you know, with those upstream projects, as long as we have the contributors to do it. It's continuously tested. And when it comes to you know, who we're expecting to use it, well, basically anybody who comes to Fostem. I mean, you, know, you are the target audience for Tumbleweed perfectly. As I mentioned with original Tumbleweed, so this is before 2014, it was a rolling update repository that we added to an existing the existing OpenSUSE distribution. So you started with the base system. We released that every six months or eight months or a year, depending on how things were going. And then you'd you know, be able to roll on top of that. The focus, obviously, with Greg, he was interested in the kernel. 
his desktop environment of choice. And you know, the community added other things as well. So it's basically sort of a bit of user space and a bit of kernel space. And most of the stuff in between, we just relied on the stability, the, sta the stable base to work fine. And if it didn't work fine, then Tumbleweed would quite often just overwrite those packages with whatever it needed in that in that rolling bit. So you know, it was a Franken it, it you know really really was, you know, it was built that way by design. Um, partly because it was easy to maintain that way. And then of course every every night eight months we'd do another open release, and then have to reset the whole thing to zero again and start from scratch, which was a huge problem. <laughs> So the, the partially rolling, the, the franken SUSE approach, it, it just did not work. We tried it for several years. The main problems we had were packages breaking sort of over that chasm between the, the stable base and, and the rolling part. You know, some dependency requirements or whatever. You know, just weird behavior issues appearing out of nowhere, weird dependency issues, seg faults you couldn't believe. And of course, you can deal with those issues one by one, and then you ad hoc replace those broken parts so the tumbleweed rolling stack on top gets a little bit bigger and replaces more from your base system. But then your stable base is no longer stable. Um, so you've defeated the point of trying to be partially rolling. And then this reset to zero meant you'd be happily rolling along, and then we do a new major release, and you're back to square one and starting again. Um, which, yeah, it was just painfully disruptive for users. You know, so often we avoided rolling back package versions, but it was still a complete, you know, a complete script because you really had two different communities working on it. You know, the, the the stable guys working on the stable distro, and the tumbleweed guys packaging things slightly differently and you know targeting their audience slightly differently. <laughs> And looking at this, um, the, the OpenSUSE team at SUSE spent a really long time analyzing how to, how to actually fix sort of both, all of these problems properly. I mean, they, they started first looking at our dev branch and looking at how do we get that more stable. Um, I kind of started looking at it from the other side of, okay, how do we get Tumbleweed more stable? And we kind of ended up meeting in the middle. Um, and I f we found what I, I really think is a universal truth, that when you're building a distribution with you know, several thousand moving parts, if, you're gonna, if you need to move, if you need to be ready to move any part of that, you know, any package anywhere, you've got to be prepared to move everything. You've got to have the tools, the techniques, the processes that, okay, that new dependency from upstream is going to you know, require you to, yes, change your init system and your kernel and God knows what else. And you have to be able to be prepared to do that at a moment's notice. And if you're, not, if you're not able to do that, you're not able to do a rolling release consistently. You might be to start for a short period of time. Sooner or later, you'll hit a brick wall and stop and have real pain. So to get this solved properly, you need to always be ready to change everything at a moment's notice. Thankfully, in OpenSUSE, we had two aces up our sleeve. The OpenSUSE build service, which is what we've been using for years for building all of our distributions. Um, and it, it really has always embraced and tackled this idea of uh, distribution is a cohesive product. You know, it, we build all our packages there, but the build service is aware of all those dependencies. If it needs to start, if it needs to rebuild, a dis rebuild part of those packages, it does, so it can rebuild part of the dependency tree, it's dependency aware. It's what OpenSUSE and SUSE have been using for years for building our distributions. It's also cross-distribution support, which, you know, that kind of challenge of being able to build dist for other distros as well really taught us a heck of a lot of how to handle dependency trees because, you know, Debian does it way different from RB RPM and, you know, Arch. And, and we even had one guy who patched in Gentoo support for the build service, which was just pointless but beautiful. <laughs> um, and, yeah. It's used by, it's not used, but used by us, you know, on cloud, Linux Foundation use it for Tizen, VLC, plenty of other people use it too. Um, so we had the tools for building um, and, you know, really kind of helped with that rolling stuff already. But you've got to test the thing as well. And, yeah, my other job when I'm not doing OpenSUSE stuff is working in QA. Um, and, yeah, OpenQA is our really nice testing tool for this. Um, we have a boost downstairs uh, for this weekend. Unlike every other testing tool I've ever found, this tests from a user's perspective. You know, we're not necessarily caring about the code. It's API neutral. You don't have to teach it what the API needs to do. You tell OpenQA what is the user expected to do with this software. What commands are they going to type? 
what buttons are they going to click? Um, because OpenQA is also graphically aware, so we can actually look at the screen. We have OpenCV running on there. It can even actually do screenshot analysis or partial screenshot analysis. So is this UI element on the screen, whatever, or where it needs to be? And yeah, therefore you can test the entire distribution end to end from the way the users are going to use the damn thing. Without this, we couldn't do Tumbleweed the way we're doing today. Um, and in fact, it's, it, it adop its adoption in a serious sense really began with Tumbleweed. And since then, we've now started actually using it for the more stable distribution of, of OpenSUSE Leap and for the enterprise products at SUSE, which are all testing using the same framework. Um, in terms of what it can test, it's pretty much anything. You have a nice dashboard with hundreds and hundreds of scenarios. I mean, I got to A to E here on one example. Um, and in fact, it's a really bad screenshot because I've missed out four of the columns, but it's also got support for multiple architectures. So here we're testing Intel, but we can also test ARM, S390, Power, 32-bit Intel if you're interested. Mostly based, on, mostly based on VMs, although we have support now for testing on bare metal as well. So what it normally does, we'll you know, start up with the distribution, fire it up in a VM, start testing it the way a user's going to do it, start the installation, run through the install, Installs finished, start up the applications. If you want to feed it a disk image already of an existing installation, then you can do nice fancy stuff like doing upgrade testing and migrations and all that kind of stuff. Um, has support for multiple machines, so you can do like cluster tests and other weird and wonderful stuff with that. And like I said, it's graphically aware. So when something goes horribly wrong, you can actually see, okay, my, I was expecting a, a tumbleweed, uh, you know, a nice dark blue screen on the left there. Um, but in fact, the system running, you know, came up with the wrong graphic. So even those tiny little behavioral changes, which, you know, they're not bugs, it's just something that's changed upstream, get caught by OpenQA. If everything else has stayed the same way, if the UI is still working in the same way, OpenQA would just ignore it, it's fine. But if, you know, something's practically changed, the button's moved, a command's changed its function, OpenQA will always find it. So with those tools, we've developed this process for effectively continuous integration for an entire distribution. When you're submitting something to OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, you're submitting it to an OBS project called Factory. That then goes into an automatic review queue, the usual kind of RPM lint stuff of, you know, checking basic sanity checks and unit tests and that kind of, that kind of stuff, nothing too fancy. But for any package that has a potential system-wide breaking impact, which is pretty much every package, um, we have a process called staging, where OpenQA will, oh, sorry, OBS will spin up a, a variant of, of factory, well, variant of tumbleweed, with ex everything that was working in the last release, plus these changes and nothing else. So basically a what-if distribution. What if we merge this? And we run a bunch of sanity tests in OpenQA, so actual proper smoke test, booting this thing up and installing it to make sure the distribution still works. <laughs> and that takes about 20 minutes. It's not, not, a, not a long, complicated process. So something gets checked in. But this is before any human being has really actually looked at the code. No one's actually reviewed anything yet. No one's seen it. Does, does it. does it work? Is it even worth looking at? If it doesn't, it gets rejected. Dev has to go away and start again. If it passes, though, oh, then it ends up in the review queue. Then, you know, your usual kind of code reviews, spec file review, checking everything works. Then it ends up in, in factory, where all of this stuff is then put in a single repository. If we have lots of check-ins at the same time, you end up with, you know, a big pile of changes. And then we test the entire distribution end-to-end -end in a few hundred different combinations on every architecture that we're interested in. Um, that takes about... Well, depending on the hardware, six to seven hours now. Um, you know, if we've got more hardware, it'd be shorter. Um, so it's all very highly par parallelized. And that will run through all those tests. The QA is therefore totally automatic. We actually tell OpenQA what the last acceptable failures were. Because, you know, nothing's perfect, so there are sometimes acceptable failures in there. And if that new build doesn't have any new failures, it ships. It becomes tumbleweed four in the morning, whenever, it doesn't matter. Um, so that whole process is completely pipelined and automatically done. So writing these automated tests for OpenQA totally gate the quality of our distribution. So it's great, because if a user reports a bug now saying so-and-so broke, and I was doing this, 
well, just take that, translate it to the OpenQA descriptive language, you're never going to break that again. So every bug report becomes a nice, easy test case, in theory, and you can shield yourself from ever making the same mistake twice at a relatively light cost, because you're already booting up the VM, so it doesn't really take that long to pop in, do what the user's doing, and pfft, done. So functionality checks, all that kind of stuff, totally able to be shielded with this. But that also means if you, you, know, you, you do listen to my talk now and you know, do download Tumbleweed and find something you don't like, contributing to OpenQA is the easiest way of fixing that. Because as soon as you put a test into OpenQA, <coughs> it's never going to happen again. So the main website for OpenQA is open.qa. Documentation's there, and we have a nice little bug tracker, feature tracker for that. Um, if you want to know more about the whole sort of pipelining and using OBS and OpenQA for continuous integration um, at 1.30 today, which of course clashes with my other talk in Janssen, but you know, you can pick which one you like more. Um, my, colleague, my colleague Christian is talking in here about how, how you can use this approach in your project. So not necessarily on a, well, if you want to, on a full distro level, but even on just a smaller upstream project kind of thing. You can use these tools to you know, build your package in OBS, test it in OpenQA, sort of follow the same kind of pipeline. Normally when I talk to people about this, though, they say, oh, that's really fancy, but I don't want to wait for all that testing. You know, <laughs> you know, I just want it now. It's too long. You know. And in fact, there is one guy working at SUSE who does like rebuild all of factory just so he can avoid OpenQA. Um, <laughs> it, he is crazy, but he does do it. In reality, though, let's say working with upstream projects, you know, especially these really demanding ones like GNOME and KDE, the process keeps pace with them. Upstream GNOME releases their tables, and within 48 hours, upstream GNOME is in OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Faster than Arch, faster than Gentoo even. I mean, most people don't get it compiled that quickly. So, yeah, it, the process works even with these big upstream projects with, thousands, with hundreds of moving parts. In the case of KDE Plasma 4.9, which came out last week, we actually shipped it on the same day. Um, that sounds really impressive. In reality, KDE kind of cheat because they give the tarballs out five days before. <laughs> um, but yeah, we shipped on release day. It's kind of cool. Um, and we've, we've also taken that process, and of course we've got the build service, so we can do all this fancy stuff. And we actually have derivatives of Tumbleweed, you know, that kind of make that constant what if all the damn time. Because o OBS is Git aware, so we can actually attach it to GNOME Git projects or KDE Git, and then build let's say, GNOME Next or OpenSUSE Krypton, which are constantly building those packages as soon as something gets checked in and constantly testing those packages as soon as something gets checked in, and then testing the entire distribution. So we get to file all these upstream bugs before anyone else does, because we're seeing it in a context of an actual distribution all of the damn time. But on the broader Tumbleweed side, um, every week now, uh, our Tumbleweed release manager, Dominic, writes a report of, you know, what have, what's changed this week? Um, so the, the bots that do all the magic, uh, of the pipelining automatically pump out release reports and change logs of everything that changed. But that's just ridiculously long. So you know he tries to summarize it to something humans can do. Um, and he made the mistake last year of saying, it's been a really quiet week this week. <laughs> so then I went through those logs and figured out, what does quiet mean? This was last year. We did three snapshots. Snapshots are basically tumbleweed releases. So that whole pipelining, end to end, a new build, three times. So three new sets of ISOs, three new repository versions, all in there. Those versions all together contained 146 updates. We're still shipping DVDs or ISOs at least. So, you know, a bit of shuffling around of packages, 15 new packages on there, 38 packages out to make room for it, and one new kernel. Hey, that's, that's quiet. <coughs> that was a year ago. Six months ago, this was it. Five snapshots. Every single workday, we shipped another snapshot. Twice as many packages. Twice as many packages on the DVD. Twice as many we have to take out, and twice as many kernels. <laughs> it's now six months later. The last, the last decent run through we had, we had one run, run through 15 days of non-stop tumbleweed releases. You know, every day a new snapshot. I, I didn't bother doing a slide for that because I can't be bothered to read that many logs. I mean, it, it's just crazy. The process really, really works, and you can do a rolling distribution across the entire <laughs> code base without any problems. It just works. From the user side of things, though, 
that can then be terrifying because they're like, okay, all this stuff is changing. How do they deal with that? And okay, OpenQA is testing it from a practical point of view. You know, it works, but it's still changing. I mean, you know, the behavior is still going to change. Luckily, with OpenSUSE, we've got SQL source. We use BTRFS by default. And we have it by default with a, a tool called Snapper Setup. So by, on a standard Tumbleweed machine, you know, of course, you can disable it, use whatever file system you want. But by, uh, in our normal configuration, every single time you install a package on a Tumbleweed machine, you have a snapshot before and after. So if that package changes something you don't like, just roll back to the snapshot before. Keep on working. You know, go back and learn it how it works. You know, whenever you have some time, you're completely immunized from those from those behavioral changes. You're also completely immunized from us screwing up your package accidentally because you know you can always roll back to how it worked yesterday. And even if we completely balls everything up and OpenQA completely screws up and your machine doesn't boot anymore, you can still boot to that snapshot from Grub. So there's no risk as long as you're using BTFS and, and Snapper. <laughs> and there's very little risk of us with that because we're using it so much, it just doesn't break on our systems. Um, Torsten will be talking about this more um, this afternoon, um, actually more talking about sort of the next generation of this idea of not just using snapshots as a safety net, but actually you know, more of as an atomic way of delivering updates. So actually you know, doing transactional updates here. So you know, this concept, plus plus, but still using RPMs. So that's Tumbleweed. What about the dev branch? What about OpenSUSE Factory? You know, I've mentioned it's got a, a part in the process, but in reality, once we started doing this and delivering Tumbleweed to users, we realized we don't need a dev branch anymore. Factory no longer can be used by a human being. It exists in OBS, tucked away, and we never publish it. We don't have a traditional dev branch anymore. It might be broken. OpenQA will tell us if it is. We won't make it tumbleweed. If it works, it's tumbleweed. So the, the old Greg's tumbleweed, we basically took the name, the old factory, we put, added testing, and then we called this a new tumbleweed. So it's a bit of a new distribution. And yeah, no more, no more dev branches. We're rolling on for that. And it serves that same purpose while also serving all those other purposes the rolling release does of you know, hitting a bigger user base, being more useful, dealing with upstream projects, etc. But what about regular releases? I mean, you know, there's still a use case for that. Maybe not for the typical FOSTEM audience, but you know, other people, you know, don't want to necessarily have everything changing all the time. Um, well, in OpenSUSE, we kind of killed that idea off as well. Um, <coughs> partly because of declining interest in the concept, um, but also because of an alternative concept that w that's way more interesting. Um, we now have a distribution called Leap, which starts with the SUSE Linux Enterprise code base, which is now totally in OBS. So we build that you know, kind of like CentOS, I guess, but we don't limit it to be a one-to-one -one match. The community then contributes to that code base as well and adds whatever nut packages they want in addition to. So you end up with a full-blown community distribution, all fully tested, all fully integrated, <coughs> but with that nice enterprise code base underneath it, so it's rock, rock, rock solid and stable and much more conservative with its pace of change. So in the past, you know, everybody knew us as OpenSUSE, the one distribution disk project. We now have two. Tumbleweed rolling ahead. Continuously updated, continuously tested. Like I say, perfect for the FOSDEM audience. And then Leap with a shared core underneath it, sharing it with Slee. And you know, much more conservative you know, users there. Anybody who doesn't like things changing often, you know, who wants to update once a year, you know, perfect for them. Sys admins, your, your little server in the corner that you don't want to touch that often for patching. I mean, you can run a rolling release on a server. Nothing's wrong with that. But, you know, you're going to have to find some nice way of automating those updates. You don't have to worry about that with Leap. Like I said, it's kind of a combination of the OpenSUSE project and the SUSE enterprise side of things. <coughs> And this is roughly kind of, I guess, if you split it halfway, roughly how the whole thing looks. Um, so, you know, there is a shared core of a nice stable base system, which is also what the enterprise side is, is using. 
There's a small amount of, of enterprise packages um, which just don't make any sense in a community sense or, you know, covered by licenses we don't want to ship or, you know, whatever. Just, you know, doesn't make sense there. Um, and then OpenSUSE Sleep <coughs> has thousands of community packages sitting on top of that shared base. And most of those community packages, if not all of them, actually originate in some form or another from Tumbleweed, where you know it's a pure community distribution. All those packages always moving, always rolling on. The interesting question I get normally get asked at this point is, well, what about SLE? Because you know everyone knows this model. It's like you know Fedora with Red Hat. You know you do a Fedora release, and then there's a Red Hat Enterprise release based on it sometime after. You're not doing an OpenSUSE release anymore. You can't really base SLE on something based on SLE. That all gets a little bit circular. Uh, you know, what is SUSE going to do for their next release of the enterprise product? Um, well, they're going to base it on Tumbleweed. Not in the sense that they're going to do a rolling release, but the Tumbleweed base system that's constantly rolling is stable enough and usable enough that SUSE Linux will be basing SLE 13 on Tumbleweed forking from it at some point for their next release for Sleep 13. So not only does the process work for you know other guys at Fostem, even enterprises are looking at this and like, okay, that's that's the best way of us developing our next major releases. We don't need this old model of a regular release in between and all those hassles that come with that, all the work that comes with that. Um, and when you then also tie it with the leap side of things, where Leap, of course, is based on the enterprise um, service packs and that stuff as well, but with community stuff on top, you end up with this weird, nice, complicated sort of infinity loop of OpenSUSE is simultaneously downstream and upstream of SLE, and you know something that the community does in the last Leap version is a candidate for the next service pack, and you know it makes things actually way more interesting with that whole working with a corporate partner side of things, because they have a lot more options on the table, and you know it, less things get less stagnant, which also means you end up with more enterprise developers working on your code base, which is you know good for polish and everything working nice. So in review, if you're a developer and you want to deal with you know if you're dealing with any upstream project, tumbleweed is a perfect option for you. It's going to keep up with those upstream projects, more upstream projects than you're interested in. You're going to get the latest and greatest of everything. It just works. And if it doesn't work exactly the way you want it to, it's really easy to contribute to. You know, we've got OBS, and we've got OpenQA, so you can make sure we don't break it the same way. <coughs> so yeah, and of course, you've got Snapper, so you can just get back on with your work in the meantime when you haven't got the time to deal with that. So it's a perfect platform to work on and work with us on. Especially if you're an upstream developer as well, targeting Tumbleweed seems like a natural choice for, more, for quite a few projects. You know, it's a distribution there. We have all these tools. You can do stuff with us first at a nice pace, get everything checked with the latest kernel and the latest system D and the latest Python or whatever, and then worry about how those other slower distributions are going to have to deal with it. And if you want to then use our tools like o OBS to actually do that building, <coughs> It's perfect, because you can actually build originally for, for OpenSUSE and then flick a few switches and build for a different RPM distribution, and then you know add a Debian file and flick a few files and you're building for Debian. I mean, it, it, the build service takes care of all of that, so it's a perfect platform for that. And like I say, containerized applications are cool for those other distributions, but they're actually more work for you in the long run, that's what I'm talking about later. This is actually less work. We're, you know, the community takes care of a good chunk of this, you just have to worry about your little part on top. And if you're a user, you manage to get the latest and greatest of everything. It just works. If it doesn't, Snapper's there to take care of it. And it's a perfect place to start contributing. Because that barrier of entry is so low, it's easy to just throw something at the build service and say, hey, I want to submit this. If it doesn't work, it'll be open QA or kick it out right away. It's easy to get your feet wet, easy to start contributing with us. So it's a perfect platform to start with that. Um, you don't just have to take my word for it because I've actually, we've actually been looking at the statistics of how many people are using Tumbleweed since this transition from partially rolling and the, the dev base, the dev branch, to just having a pure rolling release and no dev branch. And our user numbers are looking quite good. 
Um, you know, we've, from a, if you look at purely from a dev branch perspective, you know, our dev branch now has 10 times more users than we ever had. If you factor in the partially rolling distribution, it's growing at 67% a year. And we, really weirdly, those weird little peaks around a April seem to match up with Ubuntu releases, and I'm not entirely sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, kind of fun. So um, yeah, that's it for me. I have a bit of time, I think. So yeah, 10 minutes, so 10 minutes for questions. Yes, Len. How do I report it back against the rolling release so that you can reproduce it? Where's the reference that I can give you so you are the same code base to reproduce what I'm trying to report? The if very rarely does a problem actually live in just that, but if it happens, um, because we have this snapshot model, so effectively every single tumbleweed version you're using is an entirely cohesive distro, you actually have a version number for your distro in ETC OS release. Um, it's the ISO date for the day of the snapshot. So you can mention that there. We can then fish it out of OBS and run that there. What we'll normally do is just see, does this happen on the latest version? Because if we fixed it already, that makes it really easy to close the bug. But so, so while it's rolling, you still basically have a distribution release. And yes, release. and another release, and another release, and another release. So yeah, that's, that's part of the whole kind of building it consistently side of things. Yes? Uh, <coughs> sometimes uh, maintainers of de development projects, they refuse to enable the open source of Tumbleweed build uh, target. Yeah. Um, and, and they said, oh, you, uh, that's already factory enabled. But when I contribute packages, I'd like to make sure, OK, um, there, there are two purposes, uh, contribute back. Yeah? But, yep. but, but my main purpose is uh, to get the package built for open source Tumbleweed for my running system. Yep. Very soon, you know. So, and um, so, what's your perspective? Should every every project enable OpenSUSE Tumbleweed? This this snapshot as, yep. a, as a build target. Um, it, yeah. Generally speaking, most develop projects should. Well, most develop projects shouldn't need to enable it because they should be submitting everything into Tumbleweed already. So this this shouldn't really be an issue. In the sense of you know, divert, you know, OBS in yeah, the but build but service. I want to have it, you know, you are fast, you know. But, yeah. but I want to have it now. Yeah, you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to forget the testing, and you I, just you just want it now. I, 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 usually, I contribute. Yep. Uh, when I made sure that it works for me, you know. So so and um, yep. so I'd like to have the package now. Yeah. For this particular template with yeah. snapshot, and not uh, you know. Not not factory with 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 that diff later, of, you know? of potential day. Yeah. Um, yeah, in that case, persuade them. If they get stuck, call the board. I mean, we can we can help out with that. It, it's you know, there's no problem on build from a build side of things. Yes. Uh, previously, you test uh, passively with the users. Yes. And now you use OpenCV. Yep. Um, who's writing uh, the test and what's the proportion of contribution versus what Susie is doing? Um, well, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the question was, um, you know, we were passively testing in the past. We're now actively testing who's writing those tests. You know, is it SUSE or the community or, or whatever? Um, because OpenQA's adoption really started in the community, um, most of the tests were open SUSE tests first. And it's only in the last year or two where SUSE has actually been sort of actively contributing to OpenQA. So it's a, open, it's a community project first which now has enterprise guys working on it too. Um, so most of the tests come, uh, most of the tests kind of come from that kind of original group of original contributors and now the enterprise side of things. Um, the process is, is totally open. All the tests are in GitHub. So um, even for the enterprise stuff, actually, we've, we've left that all open as well. So relatively easy to write a test, submit it in. Um, generally speaking, I think there's no objection to this, but generally speaking, we don't get that many contributions from individuals outside kind of I guess the kind of tumbleweed release management loop like people who are actively sitting there working on the factory process contributing a lot maybe the release manager for tumbleweed they're the ones who see the things break initially before anyone's actually got it because you know we haven't shipped it yet and they'll just throw together a test and patch it in so I'd like to get that a bit more broad so that's kind of one of the reasons I'm here is if there's stuff in tumbleweed you download it you try it and you just don't like it and it's missed in the current process. That's why I've got those links in the slide so you can, you know, broaden that out a little bit because, you know, we don't scale. 
but the process does. Yes, Len. As I'm working on an open source project that tries hard to support the most prominent distribution, I must admit that I'm not sure if we would be able to cope with that pace in, in making sure that we, on the one hand, support our project and code base on, on this rolling release and still being able to support all the other more common and, and slower distributions. If you're, if you're a project depending on, on, on certain frameworks and, and they change, you have to come up with lots of quirks to be able to support the latest version of the framework with Tumbleweed while still being backwards compatible to the old stuff in those traditional distributions that have a large use of this. So it, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge, yeah. but then when you also look at the trend of um, you know, even enterprise distributions playing around with the idea of things like modules and you know whatever. So you know, certain parts of enterprise distributions are moving faster than others. It, it's a problem that everybody's going to have to deal with at some point. You know, the the reality is, all, you know, we can't. The re the regular model doesn't quite work. What I actually think the solution might be um, is taking this process and finding some way of defining a more moderate cadence. You know, Tumbleweed runs as fast as we can contribute. You know, maybe there's a, a rolling release model that fits that problem nicer of, of something that kind of you know runs a little bit slower to fit a, a, you know what everybody else can keep up with. Yes. Um, how big is the gap between the traditional releases and the Tumbleweed? Uh, especially when you uh, want to distribute uh, the 42.3. Yep. You have a stable kernel uh, based on noise less curve. Yep. And, uh, but Tumbleweed is constantly moving. Yes. Everything. So uh, I'm more interested in uh, the next stable release. Yep. One. The, the gap is large and admittedly does get larger the you know it gets larger the more of these service packs are um, you know it, it's a fact of life that stable base isn't going to move you know that fast however if you look at um, for example how SUSE has done SLE 12 compared to SLE 11 the amount of change in each enterprise service pack has been significantly f more and faster than in the traditional sort of SLE 11, SLE 10 and, and earlier era. Part of the reason SUSE has been able to do that is because OpenSUSE is doing what we're doing with Leap and Tumbleweed. So, you know, things like jumping a new kernel version in service pack 2 isn't quite so terrifying when Tumbleweed already was running it for a year. So, yeah, it's... So you, you see this kind of balance of, of enterprise distros catching up because the rolling release is going really fast. Uh, him first, sorry. Yes. Um, so you talked a lot about the advantages of this release model. Yes. If you had to change one thing or improve one thing in the, in the Tumbleweed release model, what would it be? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the, okay, the one thing the one thing I would improve right now is act, um, actually have a delay between building and and uh, building and actually publishing. Right right now, we as soon as it's built and tested and everything's fine, we're publishing it. We need to put a delay in there because now we have all that crazy number of users. Our mirror infrastructure can't keep up. So if if <laughs> if you if if you're one of those poor guys who hits that new snapshot first thing before our mirrors have synced. Yeah, it's going to be slow. So we, we, we've really got to find a way of, of kind of teaching the build service that, okay, it's ready, push it out to all the mirrors, and then flag it up for everybody to use. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's on our list at the moment because it's painful at the moment. Okay, I'd like to add something to this. Yeah. Because uh, I run several VMs with Tumblebeat, and uh, I think one improvement could be to have a, to have a yeah, to have an easy way to have a caching proxy, you know, if you, if you run yep. several systems, you know, and, and you have a caching proxy to, to, to save your bandwidth, you know? So, yep. So, uh, we actually have instructions on the wiki how to do that already. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In, the mirror, in the mirror guides, actually. Okay. Though, so, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. We have an async server, you can do all of that. Okay. And another question would be, um, will this new mo uh, release model with the Co-op 13 yep. change the or improve the confusion about leap, uh, leap because on the open source factory mailing list, even others, even even people more familiar with all this, are sometimes confused of what to take from leap and what to take from you know. And then they say, okay, uh, there's a list. Uh, it's ca called from Sli, uh, yep. pulled from Sli or pulled from uh, factory. But then you also see, oh, there's a pull from older leap. You know? Yeah. 
the, Honestly, I'm pretty much confused. Uh, uh, part of the reason for that confusion, when we, you know, this is all a relatively new concept. When we first started Leap, we purposefully didn't define where this line was between the shared core and the community stuff, because we wanted the community to help define that. So, yeah. We, so you know, for, 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 for 40, that, that's the safe bet. Push to factory, push and tumbleweed, it'll always work. And it'll always get to where it needs to go. Um, but the, in the case of uh, 42.1, yeah, we, we, we were purposefully leaving it very open to divide that line around. 42.2, we made it way more.